as a data vault guru, pragmatic guide to building a data vault. So um, first of all, uh, when the guys asked me about um, talking about the, the book, why I did it, uh, why, uh, what it covers and whatnot, um, basically um, I was between contracts last year, thanks to COVID. So um, part of what I do at a customer site is build a, a knowledge base at the customer site so that, um, you know, once I've delivered a data vault and at least um, the, the framework for one, they can go ahead and do their own data vaulting uh, after, of course, they're doing the training and stuff. So I wrote the book during that time. I thought uh, it would give it a fresh perspective on, on uh, building a data vault. Also, that it felt like it, it would probably be the right time to write something uh, about uh, data vaults, uh, um, particularly since uh, Bill Inman attended the uh, Data Vault uh, Worldwide Consortium in 2019. He updated the definition of a data warehouse and it included the, the uh, reference, or not a reference, but the importance of having a business key and having data around a business key. And um, that really speaks to a data vault if you've done it before. Um, also around about the same time, the Eggerson Group uh, published a um, trends for the next year or two uh, in 2020. They um, particularly said that um, Data Vault is going to reach a, a tipping point. Uh, I thought, well, it's a good time to, to put something together. Um, something that, that I found that I've um, uh, been practicing in a sense, that's every, every client site anyway. So that bottom quote there is actually for one of the customers who uh, reviewed some of my work that I did on site and really liked the, the way I presented the, the work on site. And um, I guess I felt that uh, uh, if you wanted to explain something, you should be able to explain it in simple terms. Now, Data Vault being just, you know, not just hubs, links, and satellites. Um, I included a lot of diagrams, a lot of documentation, and a lot of uh, uh, explanations, as well as real world scenarios in the book itself. So it's not uh, uh, modeling some arbitrary um, thing. It's looking at uh, um, some examples for the finance sector, right? The other, the other quote that I, that I came across about two years ago is the one by Melvin Conway. Um, Conway's law states that um, you know, organizations are basically their communication channels are built around how they do business, right? And to me, um, that exactly def uh, describes what a data vault is. Um, you won't go and find a book that sits uh, like something that Lynn Silverstone publishes. It says these are the industry models for um, your enterprise or your your uh, data warehouse. Um, that's why you won't see something like that for a data vault. Basically. Every enterprise is different. Every enterprise's communication channels are different. They, they will have similar things that they care about, similar business objects, but how they apply that will, will more than likely be different, right? So I've, I've like I said, I've been practicing uh, writing uh, and explanation, explaining things in uh, data vault terms. So I publish uh, quite a few um, articles every now and then when I get inspired. Some of them has been uh, published on the Data Vault Alliance page itself. A lot of it's on, on, on LinkedIn, um, explaining things like, um, you know, what do you do with your data if um, it's been superseded, like uh, bring out that you're dead, right? Uh, solving time time crime which talks to uh, uh, speaks about uh, uh, timeline corrections in, in data vault you know how, how do we do that uh, and sometimes uh, uh, when discussing things with a customer it's it, it's good to get feedback um, in terms of you know what they are understanding of something like ghost records and zero keys and stuff like that uh, because that really feeds into to uh, uh, documenting or or better yet, writing things down in a simple way so that you can compare the two and, and understand why these things exist in the data vault, right? And um, of course, once the, the slide pack is sent out, all the links are there to all these articles, uh, things like discussing temporal data and that, that kind of stuff, in addition to, to what's uh, been put into the to this book, right? 
So uh, the, other, the other thing that, that uh, uh, I guess I had good experience on is actually automating a data vault myself. So the first time I, I really did it was uh, back in my SaaS days. I, uh, I built an automation engine based on SaaS and backended by SQL Server. So um, basically the, the, the customer can uh, model what they want in SaaS, uh, data modeling, and uh, the, the tool had an interface that you generated all the code, which was then scheduled to run on, on a SQL Server platform. Uh, this was excellent experience for myself because I, I knew how to build an automated data vault, which uh, at another customer, they didn't want to buy a tool off the shelf either. They wanted to, to um, augment their existing platform to automate data vault structures uh, and populate in the data vault. So I was in an excellent place to, to help them augment what, they, what they're doing and deliver something that's in a data vault 2.0 fashion. Right. So um, the book itself uh, split into five parts. Uh, I thought that would be a, a good logical way to split it. Um, most books start off with, with, with a introductory section, which is basically what I've done. However, um, the book is not for people who've never heard of data warehousing. So when you start out on the book, um, the first part really dives into uh, understanding things like uh, business architecture, um, things that, that, that uh, um, make up the business, which every business is different. Uh, what, what business actors are, what uh, uh, business processes are, and then getting into the more detail uh, around governance, auditing, um, business keys, different types of keys. And uh, then I uh, split that out into the modeling itself with real world examples and, and SQL uh, on how to populate and query it. And uh, then I followed up with uh, automation patterns. Now I specifically um, did not make it uh, based on a tool uh, because uh, this, includes all the SQL, uh, parameterized SQL on how to do automation in, in your own site. You know, um, for example, if you had to uh, use DBT Vault that you, you guys use, you can get into the code to understand what it's doing in, on the inside, which is great. You know, uh, I think you can really, really deliver a proper data vault when you understand how it all mechanically fits together. Uh, chapter eight is dedicated to timeline correction. So this was a concept that was uh, introduced um, about two years ago that um, within this chapter uh, includes patterns on how to deal with uh, data, batch data that arrives out of sequence. For, for example, you've loaded Monday's data. Uh, if this was a daily batch, you've loaded Monday's data. Wednesday, you've loaded uh, Wednesday's data, and on Thursday, Tuesday's data arrive. You know, what do you do? How do you handle it? You know, how can you do it dynamically? Uh, so th that's a chapter that, that focuses on that. Uh, a test framework, of course, with the data ops uh, mindset. Everything gets tested as soon as it goes in. So the same sort of uh, uh, mindset is applied in Data Vault. It does have a test framework. There are automation patterns for it. And then chapter uh, or part four, we dig into consumption patterns. So um, I've encountered this at a customer site where everybody's excited about building a data vault. But then when it comes to it, they realize, oh, wait, how do we get the data out? You know, so uh, just like having patterns to load and model hubs, links, and satellites, they are repeatable patterns to pull the data out as well. And uh, query assistance tables uh, to help um, speed up the retrieval of data to, to populate your information marks, which can be views. And, and lastly, the, the, the final part is digs into um, other patterns around data vaults, as in different uh, industry models that can be loaded into data vaults, which you know is agnostic, so it can fit anything, but um, it also digs into uh, all the, the checklists and, and schematic um, sort of an itemized list on how to build a vault, how to, how to, how to judge a tool, um, whether it meets all the standards that uh, you put out there. I mean, what I put out there is what I would expect a, a tool to do. 
uh, and there's, there's various other lists which we'll, we'll show through the slides. So without further ado, we jump in. The old, the old way of building a data warehouse has been this sort of life cycle, right? We have a first project that comes in and we say the cost is a couple of thousand dollars or pounds in your case. And uh, everybody's very excited, a new requirement comes in and then we have to do regression testing so that we don't break what's already there. So we build this, this uh, uh, second data mart. Costs are pretty similar, but starts to cost a little bit more to, to deliver it, you know, because you want to deliver something that doesn't break what's, what's there already. So as, as the third project comes along, this cost starts to escalate and starts to escalate some more, right? What we uh, profess with the data vault method, which the book also gets into, is that, okay, with the data vault, there is an upfront cost, absolutely. Um, it's a different way of, of thinking, of uh, modeling your, your enterprise data warehouse. It's also a different way of, of, of thinking about your architecture. So there, there is a, a, an upskill requirement, uh, not just in tools, but in methodology. So, and uh, I have found that once, once a, a customer staff, or it could be a business analyst or, or the like, uh, have attended training, they know what kind of questions to ask. You know, I mean, obviously you take training, it, uh, you've got all the material, but then you've got to apply it, right? It's the, the um, principle around cognitive, cognitive load. You have all the information in your head, it's now, now it's just to go back and retrieve it and fill those gaps, right? So metaphorically, um, why, the way I like to, to talk about it is uh, uh, in comparison between Kimball modeling and uh, Data Vault is let's say I've got a requirement and I need to draw a painting or paint a painting. Uh, and my requirement is uh, I want to paint a Renaissance woman, you know, so easy. I've got a frame, I paint her in, job's done. But now there another requirement comes in. I said, oh, actually, I want my painting to have trees. So like, oh, that's okay. I've got space for that. I'll paint some trees. So you put some trees on the side. So, well, you know what, um, my new requirement, and I, and I don't want you to break anything that you've done already, is I want to make sure that it's uh, during the day. Okay, that's no problem. I got space to, to fill in the sun. I can, you know, paint the background uh, a light blue so it looks like the, uh, it's day. Uh, but now I've got a new requirement. I say, oh, well, actually, I also want to show that it's nighttime. So, oh, okay, I, I can, I can, I can picture it. I can do it. So you paint it in, right? And a new requirement comes in. Says, oh, somewhere I want you to put a, a man in the picture. So, ah, okay, I can fit this in. And then you paint, you paint maybe, I don't know, a mustache or something like that. And then, oh, but I also want a cowboy in the picture. So, oh, uh, okay, I can, I can fit that in my painting. So, oh, but I got another requirement. So I also want to put a car into the painting, right? Now, the, the, the mart, the information mart starts to become this sort of conglomerate mess of so many different requirements. And we're trying to appease the different stakeholders of, this, of the same information mart that uh, are being consumed by the business. I mean, how do you start to manage this? How, how do you manage the, the, the technical debt that comes with it, right? And with the data vault approach, what happens is that we don't immediately load into an information what that's conformed with, with all these uh, requirements into it. We have everything itemized, you know? Uh, um, everything is a decoupled component of an enterprise data model. And when it comes time to actually deliver information mods, um, you can just pick the components you want and you can deliver the, the type of information you want, you want, right? All the components are available. And if, if the information marts are delivered as views, um, it's, it's easy to change. It's just a change in the SQL script, right? And because there are views, um, the data is immediately available you know, um, from whichever data vault artifact it comes from. So, um, the thing that to, to remember about when, when you are modeling this uh, data vault or, or your information marks requirements is that where is this data coming from? You know, uh, uh, it, is, it is a business case that would ask, all right, we need to model these requirements, we need to get the data out, we need to fill some sort of dashboard or, or the like, but the data is coming from business processes and this comes from business architecture, the explanation of, of business architecture. You know, uh, there's a starting point, there's an ending point, and there's a lot of steps in between. And business keys are 
are representing those business objects or those business actors and those business keys and all the details about it and its relationship to other business keys is what gets captured into the data vault, right? From, from this uh, uh, business process, we, we, uh, uh, the automated business process outcomes are retrieved from the source platform, either push or pull, and then we historize it into a data vault. But, you know, sometimes um, the, the source platform doesn't have all the components we need. And this is where maybe a business vault comes in, right? Uh, business vault is the, the derived content based on raw content, right? So in this example, the business process has a gap. The gap is in that purple section on the bottom there, is that it, uh, the, the automated platform that delivers this uh, 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 business process automation is unable to assign account numbers to a co credit card, right? So um, we have to build that rule into raw vault. Um, if at some point the, the uh, uh, source system can deliver it, uh, then it would supersede the business vault artifact that we built to solve that problem. Uh, but often that's, that's uh, not the case. Often you see that maybe that the uh, uh, source platform is a third party provider with its own customers, which could be hundreds or thousands of them. So sometimes this business vault artifact has to become more permanent, you know, which is fine. Um, when delivering a, a data vault, these, these components are decoupled so they don't interfere with each other. Once you have the raw vault delivered, you can derive all this business vault content, right? So there can be a lot of it. There's, there's a, a business processes being mapped all over the place between the partners, between the entire enterprise. The whole ontology is uh, uh, um, re being represented by the different departments and every single one of them have uh, uh, business processes linking them together. Some of them are sharing business keys, some of them are not. Some of them have their own representation of the same business entity, but they have their own business key, right? Um, a data vault is flexible enough to um, historize all the raw data, as well as providing the, the derived decoupled um, content stored in, in the business vault, right? So once enterprise starts to look like this, that, that they have all their components all joined together by uh, uh, representative hubs that represent the business, right? Then the enterprise starts to look something like a, a, a level five uh, CMMI um, type of enterprise where all, we, all we're doing is, is uh, never uh, refactoring, never blowing away an enterprise data warehouse, but any changes is just an addition to the existing uh, data vault tables. And, you know, things can be de uh, um, uh, deprecated is not the right word, maybe sunsetted, you know, but that's just the evolution of business processes, right? So as a new source comes in, we can bring it in. If our marts need to be re uh, re rejected, that's okay, there are views. So the, the enterprise or the data vault model, at least, is in a state of eventual cons consistency. Right, any part of the model could be uh, being updated at any, any point in time. So what does that look like? The data platform itself, um, you know, these days is data lake um, and you can have a data warehouse on top of it. Uh, some platforms start, uh, are starting to blur that line between data lakes and data warehousing, which is fine. Data vaults is suited for that. Uh, one customer I worked at was actually using um, Parquet as their data store uh, for satellites, hubs, and links. And their automation engine was based on Apache Spark. You know, they, they, they uh, with our guidance, uh, wrote the automation of loading hubs, links, and satellites and how to model it, all, all the work. And um, it was all based on, on, on Parquet, Apache Spark, and a whole bunch of open source tools to pull the data out and to do automated data quality testing and the like. So that was a really exciting project. But in, in the in the basis of everything, um, typically this is what your architecture looks like. You got your unstructured and structured on the left. Maybe it's mastered uh, going through the uh, enterprise data store, which we'll call a data vault, and the information is delivered to the uh, business users, right? And the way you can visualize that in the modern platform, raw data is uh, landed 
in a, a, a platform, a data lake or data warehouse platform. Rule, some hardening rules are applied to the data to clean it up a little bit, which um, is, is a valid use case. And then the data is refined and then it's provisioned to the business users, right? And the book dives into how to do all that, as well as different uh, implementation styles of, of uh, data vaults. You know, because uh, there are patterns for modeling the data vault, there are also patterns for uh, building a data vault in terms of architecture. Um, you really need to just decide what suits your platform, what, what, uh, what can you use um, advant advantageously by the platform? Does it do distribution keys? Is it an MPP platform? Is it not an MPP platform? You know, is it parquet files? I mean, how do you deal with that? The, uh, because the parquet files are external tables and there's no indexing, it's all partition keys, right? So um, you could be building a data vault where the data is landed and immediately loaded to a raw and business vault, or um, it is staged and a, a, a raw and business vault is delivered as views on top of the, the, the um, stage table as a, as a persistent staging, meaning that your raw and business vault can just be blown away. But it also means that if you're delivering information whilst it's views, that you got view on view complexity. So there's pros and cons to, to an approach like this, which the book dives into, of course. Um, you could maybe load everything as physical tables directly into a raw and business fault together at the same time, coming from the same source. Or uh, you can virtualize staging and then physicalize your business and, and raw vault. There's pros and cons to that, that too. Um, you can deliver the raw vault as physical tables and then just make business vaults as views. Now, I've seen that been done before, but then you, you have to ask your, um, you know, yourself the questions or, or the, the uh, profile of what you're building. Do you want to have views as uh, business vaults as views, or do you want to have the same auditable patterns used for raw vault being used for business vault? You know, there's pros and cons to, to each one. Um, and of course, uh, uh, you can physicalize everything uh, raw to business and then just have the, the information marked based on raw and business fault. And if that's not performing very well, there's also the option of, of using query, query assistance tables, which are your classic pits and bridges or the like, right? So um, we also dig into what are the, the different types of rules in, in uh, uh, data vault and where they sit. So um, you could be delivering your business fault, um, sorry, your business rule engine as a, a ETL tool, you know, from raw vault to business vault, basically um, doing case statements and, and, and the like and joining tables and doing all those, those wonderful things. But it doesn't mean that that must be the only uh, business rule engine tool you use. You could be using uh, machine learning output, you know, any sort of tool that, that, that uh, uh, uses the raw data as a platform and creates an output that's then ingested into a business vault. And it's available for, you know, for um, you know, consumption by the information mark layer. Yeah. Um, and I'll put their uh, function rules because this speaks to uh, what tool is actually uh, querying the information mark layer. So often you have to massage the, the marks in a certain way so that tools like maybe Tableau and Power, Power BI can use that data, right? Um, so later on, we also expand on the raw and business vault with some ideas and some implementations of a schema vault. Uh, this is something that I did build before, uh, which I'm still uh, keeping alive, uh, is a schema that registers everything about the, the data, data vault platform with specific intelligence about hubs, links, and satellites and how they link together. Uh, because if this is used as a base, you can historize that and replay what the data vault model looked like at any point in time, which might be useful for you, you know. And of course, you could test different iterations or different versions of the same data vault. Um, we discuss uh, how to build a Jira vault, you know, um, just like DBT, uh, documentation is done in the code so that when you're uh, querying or sorry, when you're accessing that data lineage and the documentation, the documentation is all there already. You know, you don't you don't create a separate uh, Word doc to uh, explain what was being put, put into the, the platform. And just like uh, um, uh, uh, pull requests, 
uh, you have to provide documentation. And the same with lights for Jira, right? Um, everything uh, these days through Scrum or Kanban uh, needs a Jira story. So how do you tie that to, to your data vault? So when you know, when, when you look at a record in your data vault, you know what ticket actually um, was responsible for loading that record or what initiative was 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 uh, started to get that data in. You can easily reference it. Just you know, the Jira ticket is in there. You can you can reference it, and the classic metric vault, of course, with the log entries and you know accounts and uh, how, how the platform is performing and the like. So um, of course uh, we combine the different types of uh, data models. Um, this is something that's uh, mentioned in uh, a book by David Hayes. A really good book. Uh, discussing the different types of data models that you see in the, in the, in the industry, um, enterprise models that look like uh, master data management models. So they try to, to fit every type of scenario that um, that uh, it, it could cater for. So in that type of uh, data source data model, uh, you're going to have a lot of tables just to do simple things like uh, uh, putting a relationship between a party and a person, or party and org, or, or a, a, a classic one is a location group where location groups got addresses and and telephones tied to a a party right um, industry models uh, functional models um, you know any type of those models can be fit into a data vault you know you just you, you need to know how to right um, so we we dig into the classic hubs links and satellites what they are um, what they look like uh, what they look like in uh, uh, today with the uh, business key collision codes and, and, and the like. And uh, we take the, those three conceptual or, or those three core structures. And we also discuss the, the different variations of those structures, you know, satellites with dependent child keys, multi-active satellites, where, we, where you would use them, why you wouldn't use them, um, business fault as well, uh, as well as uh, uh, CDC type structures. You know, if you're getting data and you don't need to split the content, then um, CDC or change data capture by definition is new. Why would you use the same loading structure or loading uh, um, code to check if the record is new when by definition it is, right? Uh, the peripheral structures like uh, record tracking, status tracking, the, the very um, sometimes hard, hard to wrap your head around effectivity satellites where, where its place is, how to use it, how to build it, how to query it. And the, the fairly new structure, the extended record tracking, which I said there is a chapter de dedicated to that because that, with the use of that and its timeline correction um, capability that you get with it, um, makes a big difference to the code that loads everything else in the data warehouse, uh, in, in your data vault, right? So um, we also have decision trees. So um, at, a, at a sort of generic level, um, the book also tries to show, okay, if you encounter this and this and this and you consider this and, and that, the, the flow chart can lead you down to what sort of structure you should be using, you know, uh, whether you're using a, a multi-axis satellite versus dependent child key uh, on the satellite. You know, there's, there's different situations why you would use either one, right? Uh, and uh, you can see the effectivity satellite is there because um, you know um, if you are uh, identifying the driver key, and the and the source is not providing the business date to tell you about the change in that relationship, then it's possibly time to consider an effectivity satellite, right? So uh, we also dig into a bit of mob modeling. Um, so we introduced this about uh, two, three years ago, uh, just a really interactive, collaborative way of, uh, of building out data vault artifacts. You know, um, we use this uh, with teams across the globe. So I, uh, uh, there is a, a checklist of uh, required personnel that uh, need to be in those meetings, how to set it up, how to keep the focus of the meeting. Um, and it forms part of your Scrum and Kanban work, right? So you, you, you get the requirement, you mob model um, with a source system SME at Data Vault certified personnel preferably, and uh, the business analysts and maybe an engineer, and then you model it and you deliver it, you know, and um, as, as you're building out more and more of the enterprise Data Vault model, um, the quicker the cadence is for, for this type of delivery. And as I said, I mean, 
this can be de delivered across the globe if if your enterprise is global or you know across departments if it's local it doesn't really matter but what is important and the book highlights as well is that you stick to the same standards the same governance so there is there is a, an element of data vault governance that needs to be applied where um, decisions are made depending on the data uh, um, a, a sort of a discipline is introduced, especially if you are having to build a business fault, temporary artifacts to solve something that you do have the opportunity to ask the source platform that can you solve it for us, you know, and if they can um, ensure that there is budget for that to be de to delivered and, and created as a story, a backlog story, so that at some point it is acted upon, so that uh, at some point you would uh, need a, a, a migration plan that, uh, well, maybe not a migration plan, but a superseding plan so that when the raw vault stuff comes through and supersedes what you have as a business vault artifact, you know, that uh, um, at some point that business vault artifact will be sunset, right? So, uh, of course, we get into the classic uh, uh, modeling itself, um, how to build raw vault artifacts, all of it, all the good stuff. Um, um, building business fault artifacts as well, you know, where uh, there are gaps in the, the build for the raw um, uh, automated uh, business process automated outputs. And um, we can also, uh, well, the book also shows how to, sh how to use the raw vault artifact to build the business vault artifact itself. So uh, what can happen um, not just the example that I mentioned earlier, is maybe there is a different view of how a, a third party tool sees a unit of work versus how the business sees a unit of work. And this can happen if, you, if you're using a, a third party software that's global, you know, it's going to have its own customers, maybe US based customers or another country's based customers that maybe the, the way they they model housing originations and facilities is different to how you do it in Australia, for example, which is a, reuse, a real use case. So you can think of a business vault as, as, give, as it, well, first of all, it's never a copy of raw vault, but it is the business view of the, the, the enterprise data warehouse, right? And it's not restricted to just raw vault building business vault. The same business vault artifacts can also be used to build other business vault artifacts. You know, this is where uh, you uh, work with your EDM team or your, your data architecture team to design this sort of uh, a layered approach to delivering business value, you know, uh, where uh, uh, business vault is not just used as a, as a stop gate to fill in those business processes. It can also be used to centralize your intent intelligence by reusing the same loading patterns available in, in, in raw vault, right? So we also get into comparing the different ways to represent data into a data vault, uh, raw vaults. We compare uh, dependent child keys to uh, uh, multi-active satellites. Uh, so why you would use one instead of the other, what situations you would use one instead of the other, depending on the type of source data you get. Um, whether using a multi-active satellite is the way to go, or maybe modeling it as, as uh, hubs, links, and, and satellites, you know, what's the outcome, why one is preferred to the other. And we also compare status tracking satellites to effectivity satellites. Both, both can be used against a, a relationship, with give different outcomes, you know, the book describes all that stuff. So, uh, um, of course, automation patterns, um, having a hub loader, a link loader, satellite loader, all parameterized, basically only three types of loaders you need in a data vault. There are some little tweaks when you, when you want to load a dependent child key or a multi-axis satellite, but in essence, they are just three types of loaders. So, um, those loaders would basically be used in this sort of paradigm where data is, is landed, it's staged with all the, the data vault uh, metadata tags, uh, which can be delivered as views if you want, or uh, can be physicalized. And then those loaders are, are used to load into the target data vault artifacts, right? And uh, as soon as those, those artifacts are loaded, you test. Yeah, the, the, the automated test framework would test for uh, to make sure that the stage content is loaded all the way to the hubs, which is a, 
uh, unique business keys, right? And, and the links, unique list of, of relationships or units of work. And, uh, um, you know, if your record count between your stage file and your target satellite differs, you know, it could be a number of reasons for it. It could be because you split the, split the satellite, which is a, a valid case. You know, if uh, you have PII data you need to split out or there's rates of change differences. Uh, the, the, the record count could be different between the staged and the target satellite, but also the, the data vault is, or, or the, at least the satellites are, are tracking changes. So if you've got 100 records in your, in your landed file, it doesn't mean that, you know, um, you'll end up with those same 100 records in the satellite because maybe it was loaded there before. You know, yes, they already knew about the status of, of this business key or, or this, this relationship. So it's important to, to do a, a, a testing in the data vault way so that you, you can see that uh, uh, what's been staged is loaded all the way to the end, right? So um, in an automatic fashion, all of this can be config driven as a file is landed, um, it's immediately staged and then immediately loaded and immediately test it, right? So there's a, there's a framework around that. And this is really important to grasp because um, what, we're, what we're emphasizing is here is that uh, the data vault can be updated at any point in time, uh, any time of the day. Um, we shouldn't be thinking about loading data warehouses as overnight batches. Um, there are great tools out there like uh, um, Click Attunity um, that does log scraping. So as soon as the, the, the data has been Proliferated into the source platform, you know we can scrape that data and get it landed into the, the data warehouse, um, increasing the, the the value of the data because you know the longer it sits in a, in a source platform unused and observed, maybe the value of that data is, is diminishes, right? So if, as soon as we can get the data in, we do that, and um, we also dig into the other side of the data vaults where. Uh, we discussed things about getting the data out, right? So, like I said earlier, uh, there are patterns to loading a data vault. There are also definitely patterns to getting the data out. And the book describes them with uh, very detailed SQL on how to do that. Some uh, automation um, of consumption that deals with duplicate records, which can happen if you're only selecting certain columns from certain satellites. Um, if you're selecting all the columns and satellites, you won't get duplicates, but there are patterns that deal with both, right? And if you're finding that, that the, the performance of your um, uh, querying isn't satisfactory, we've got options like pit tables, right? Point in time tables, which are a snapshot of the keys around a, a hub or a link that are used as a basis for your information marks. And uh, uh, those base, or, or those information marks and their base is also automated. So they fit around a, a center, which is your uh, either your hub or your link and its satellites around it. And we, and we also talk about the, the classic bridge table, which shortens the distance between hubs in your overall model. So, you know, you, you're gonna have to build this, this uh, bridge somewhere, but when it comes to querying it, you don't have to query all these, all these uh, keys along the way, you just, query the shortened version of it, which is in the bridge table, right? So um, we also dig into uh, how, how to query status tracking satellites, uh, record tracking satellites, effectivity satellites. There's three different ways you can query an effectivity satellite or uh, generic ways, I'm sure there's more, but this gives guidance on how to use it, especially uh, selecting the, the effective record in, a, in a, a link table, because a link table is a, is a, a many to many structure. Um, it will capture um, when the relationship changes against uh, a customer, right? And account changes. But if it changes back, how do you track that? You know, uh, within a link table structure, you can't do that. You need something like an effectivity satellite. However, of course, if your, your source platform provided that business date, it would be loaded into a link satellite instead, right? So an effectivity satellite solves something, but only if you really need it, right? So uh, what, the, what the satellite looks like, um, now this is important to pay attention to because uh, there are some columns there that don't exist or that are uh, conceptually does something very different for you. Uh, the one that doesn't exist is a uh, virtual end date, 
right? In Data Vault, we don't have end dates because updates are expensive. Instead, we use um, windowing functions to emphasize what that end date is. The other column that uh, is pretty important, and if it is available, I'd recommend that you do get it in, is the applied date. Um, basically, this is like an ex extract date, a package date, right? So you can go ahead and uh, uh, load the same packet twice, as in the same date of a packet twice. The first being the original data, and if it was corrupt, or if it's been superseded by saying, oh, actually that data is wrong, you can supersede the same applied date and use the load date as a version date. So if you pay attention to, to this um, schematic that I've got here, this example, you see the applied date uh, is the same uh, on 2020-0202, uh, but it's got different load dates. So the virtual end date would skip the, the superseded record because um, that's no longer applicable. That record is, is now um, identified as a, a record that's perhaps corrupt. And that when querying the, the data vault, you should be looking at the super, superseded record instead, right? So um, we also look at a whole bunch of different types of keys we get in data vaults, driving key, of course, smart keys, uh, zero keys, uh, junk keys, how do we deal with those? Um, they are, there is still a, a place for sequence keys in data vault. It's just not in the same place that uh, it was before. Uh, hash keys, of course, um, hash key collision strategies. There's a whole bunch of them, um, which helps uh, safeguard the whole platform against um, perhaps hash collisions. Or maybe if you're making a change uh, to your automation tool that, you know, this hash collision check maybe can save your butt before you have to roll back um, uh, data and replay it, right? So back to the, the time. Um, now, this is, this is a quick exercise that I'll do. Um, and uh, just pay attention to the fact that the first line is the applied timeline, right? So that's our applied date. So I haven't spoken about load date yet, just applied date. So if we learn about a red car and um, the, the policy is taken out on a red car on the first of the first, and the first claim that we know about is on the 15th of the third, right? We know that claims against the red car and all subsequent claims are against the red car as well, right? But now if we load more data, uh, actually, on the 15th of the 4th, uh, we did a retrospective uh, change to the uh, insured car. We said actually it was a blue car, right? Now we know that uh, claim one was against the red car and claim two and three was against the blue car, right? Happy days. Now on uh, the 17th of the 12th, uh, we learned that, um, that actually uh, there's another change. It said, um, no, actually it, it, it was a red car. So we still keep the, the timeline intact, knowing that the policy timeline, that there were changes to this car. But now looking at this timeline, we, we, we can see that the, all claims are against the red car, right? And what happens if we get a, a, a future change about a blue car you know, in the past? You know, how do we track that into the, the paradigm of applied dates, right? And further, if you were to supersede that record, like we showed before, um, actually it wasn't a red car, it was a yellow car. Meaning that claim one is against the red car, claim two and three is against the yellow car. You know? uh, and uh, how do we represent that in a table? Well, it looks simple, doesn't it? <laughs> well, what, I, what I've done is uh, I'll stop sharing this and I will switch sharing to my spreadsheet. Uh, which is this one here, right? So here we've got the table. Um, let's say we change the, the date here. Oh, actually we can just use this date. Let's say it's the 13th of the 12th. And, you know, 13th of the 12th, the applicable claims are all against the red car, right? So we can undo that and let's pick another date. Let's say, is 2019, maybe 12, 18th. Yeah, I, that falls into this bracket over here. So what happens to the timeline now? So, I mean, nothing happens to the 
data itself, it's persisted, but how you query it, you know, again, with that date tells you uh, what claims are against it, right? So let's undo that. Uh, let's go 2020, 12, 19. Right, that changes it completely over there. And our query would return, ah, we have that full timeline. You know, it was the red car, it was the blue car, it was the red car again, and it's got the two claims against it. But now the yellow car here is, is as well against the same claims. But if you look at the load date, the latest version says actually it was against the yellow car. Yeah. So that's what the, the power of, of applied date gives us is that we're able to um, actually version the record as, as it's been loaded. So not just having load date, but having applied date gives us that capability, right? So switching back to the PowerPoint, what this also allows us is um, the capability to solve timeline corrections. So the, there's a whole chapter on it and how to do it, which speaks to the, the extended record tracking satellite. And it is used alongside um, satellites, uh, regular satellites, multi-axis satellites, um, all, all the good stuff that uh, tracks changes and it can dynamically uh, correct timelines as, as faults happen, as sequences come out, uh, as tables are landed out of sequence. You know, this doesn't talk about uh, streaming data. Streaming data, that, that's a whole other kettle of fish, but this is about batch data, right? Which is typically most of the scenarios we have out there. So um, with the if, um, extended record tracking satellite in place, it can be used to correct the timeline of any satellites around a link or, or a hub. Um, so that you don't have to halt your, your process, undo the, 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 the data loads that you've done to your data warehouse and replay the, the, the data in sequence. Or another scenario is that if you have some framework that checks that, oh, hold on, this is out of sequence, with this pattern here, you don't have to wait for that out of sequence file to arrive. You just load it and worry about the, or don't worry about the out of sequence table, it will arrive and it'll be, put into its correct place, even though the satellite is a change capture structure, right? So uh, the book also uh, digs into model scorecards, automation tool scorecards. Uh, the model scorecard is inspired by Stephen Hoberman's uh, uh, scorecard. Um, I thought that was quite good. I, I adapted a version of it for uh, Data Vault. Um, there's also uh, all the, the metadata um, artifacts or how to build a schema vault as well. If this is the what, what you're after is, is uh, tracking uh, your data vaults evolution, where it was yesterday, day before, or years ago, up to you. Um, all of that's all, all that wonderful stuff is included in the book. And uh, of course, there's a, a link to the, the GitHub repository where you can download the art if you want, play with it, um, change it, up to you and uh, the book itself. So I've gotten some reviews in, which has been good. Um, includes all the SQL patterns, everything that we spoke about, everything that, uh, uh, that you can, uh, that I think you could do, uh, uh, loading, querying, uh, joining, uh, building pits and bridges and all that kind of stuff, all included in, in the, uh, this, uh, this book. And uh, that's it. That's all the details I have.